Let's get recording comments. Get a recording going. And here we go. All right. So I want to start by seeking to frame how I am positioning the concept of Christian music and how I am framing the concept of secular rhythm right from the outset. And then I'll share some considerations that we should look at in reflecting on the question. So by Christian music, let's take it firstly from the perspective of, uh, of course, we, we understand music, we can take music for granted. By Christian then, we are referring to that which has to do with the specific religion known as the Christian religion, that which revolves around, founded and established on Jesus Christ. Jesus has at its center, the Bible as its authoritative source of writing, and that which arose out of the history and people uh, described in the Bible as the, the Jews. So we often hear the term Judeo-Christian, indicating the Judaic roots of the Christian religion, the Christian faith, the Christian movement drawn from the pages of scripture, the Bible. So from that angle, Christian music then would be music about the Christian faith, music about the Christ of the Christian faith, music that seeks to communicate the sentiments, the message, of the Christian faith, portraying in the art form the message of the Christian faith. That's one perspective. The second perspective that it is important that we consider and contemplate is the perspective of music as containing different genres, different genres of music, and Christian music as a genre of music, a particular and specific genre of music. In that regard, it is important that we pull back a little bit to explore and examine the history the history of that particular genre of music. So there is a history that starts in the Bible. Of course, the Bible, Bible itself makes mention of music from the Old Testament all the way up into the New Testament. It speaks about specific musical instruments, the, the harp, the timbrel, for example. In the Psalms, it talks about an instrument known as the, the psaltery. And early on in the book of Genesis, we encounter a particular person named, and he was described as being skilled at music. Right? And then in the New Testament, we see Jesus and his disciples, for example, singing a hymn at the end of their time in the upper room. And then they went out into the Garden of Gethsemane. In the epistles, Paul, for example, talks about sing and make melody in your heart unto God. So music is very much a part of what we find of the experiences of the people recorded in the, in the Bible. And then in the, in the early church, so it has its journey. Let's 
fast forward quite a bit and come to 1947 to a man by the name of Larry Norman, who, whose lifespan, uh, life spans the years 1947 all the way up to 2008. Norman, Larry no Norman, is considered to be the father of Christian rock. This is important. The father of Christian rock, which married Christian texts to secular rock and roll, according to the New York Times. Some of his most beloved songs include, Why Should the Devil Have All the Good Music? An interesting title for a song. I'll, I'll say why that is so a little further on. And Why Don't You Look Into Jesus? and knocking on heaven's door. Norman was a pioneer of the 1970s, Jesus movement, the Jesus movement of the 1970s, where Christian songs became more accessible to a general audience and began developing as an industry within itself. So the, the whole concept of Christian music was not always in existence as a genre. It, it came into its full development in the 1970s. So the 1970s Jesus movement led to Jesus music, or what is now known as contemporary Christian music, or CCM. And that is what is, is generally considered to be the genre of Christian music. You notice that I mentioned, of, I brought in the word there now, the word secular, an old word which generally means the opposite of Christian, the opposite of spiritual, the opposite of righteous, the opposite of holy, secular, having to do with, with man, humanity, as opposed to God and deity. All right? So, um, Secular rhythm, as per the topic for this for this discussion, and secular music. Now, contemporary Christian music, as a genre, encompasses all genres of music, including Christian pop, Christian rap, Christian metal and much more. Certainly for us in the Caribbean, that would include Christian reggae, or as we more typically refer to it as gospel reggae, and gospel soca, more popular in the Eastern Caribbean. I, I, I suspect that they would all one so one would also want to say. Then we therefore need to also talk about Christian Zouk, and we can also therefore talk about Christian reggaeton. And while we're at it, why don't we also add a Christian Afrobeat? All right. So, in terms of the the genre, you, you realize what is changing is what comes after the word Christian. The word Christian is constant. What changes is the genre of music. And, and that is why the very topic that we are contemplating is itself problematic. Because it immediately presupposes and prejudices presupposes and prejudices a number of other expressions of music which are in themselves genres of music just as contemporary Christian music is a genre of music. So things become a little bit more complicated and complex from a purely musical standpoint. Horace Clarence Boyer, 
a preeminent authority on the history of African-American music says that we need to make a distinction between spirituals, songs, music that can be defined as spirituals and gospel music and how gospel has evolved. Again, things are becoming even more complex. Is Christian contemporary, contemporary Christian music the same as or, or synonymous with, automatically necessarily the same as gospel music? Or does it depend on where one is located? Some persons make a distinction between, between them. All right. Um, so Boyer makes that distinction between spirituals and gospel music and how gospel has evolved, had evolved. He said the spirituals were 19th century religious folk songs of the slaves who were seeking personal freedom. And it's particularly, it's, it's, I think it is particularly providential that here we are this evening on the very the evening of the very day when the massacre in Tulsa, Oklahoma, is being me memorialized, and the background of slavery in the United States of America, which is, in certainly in my view, not as much spoken of as the period of slavery in the Caribbean. One of the things that has been trending online on social media from yesterday is the fact that a number of persons who are in their 30s and beyond are indicating that they were never exposed to this part of the history of the United States of America. And, and I, I, I will confess to you here and now that I was today old when I learned of what exactly the second verse of America's national anthem says. I want to read it. I want to read it for us because I, it, it really struck me when it was pointed out to me by one of my coworkers today and I, I, I had to Google it. I mean, all I knew previously of the US's anthem was the opening lines, oh, can't you see? I have really, literally never really stopped to listen to it. So I was particularly shocked. Listen to the second verse, for those of you who, uh, like myself, are not familiar with it. And where is that band who so vauntingly swore that the havoc of war and the battle's confusion, a home and a country should leave us no more, their blood has washed out their foul footsteps pollution, no refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. And the star-spangled banner in triumph doth wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. I'm also familiar with that line, land of the free and the home of the brave. Now, I'll leave you to check it out further. Google it. And just read through and try to wrap your mind around what exactly is being celebrated here. What exactly is being attributed as God's victory, a victory handed down to these people by God? <laughs> Don't want to go too far into that. but. 
I, I, I'm saying this to say that according to Boyer, who is making this distinction between the spirituals, and I want to be more specific, the Negro spirituals of the 19th century, Boyer says that the spirituals were 19th century religious folk songs of the slaves who were seeking personal freedom. He continues, gospel songs are 20th century sacred songs that were conceived as a way for people to move into economic freedom. Bear that in mind, those two distinctions, we're gonna come back to. So this is a renowned authority, Boyer speaking, on the history of African-American music. Remember who we are. Primarily, I'm addressing a Caribbean audience. Remember who we are, and I'm gonna to come to that in a moment. Starting with the historical perspective. Then I'm gonna to go to the, the perspective of, of our identity as a people. So I'm gonna be raising the issues and then, um, trying to point us to how we should bring these various issues to bear on how we answer the question. Rather than coming with a, a straight out yes, no answer to the question, which I, I really believe is not where we should, the discussion, the discussion, the conversation needs to be. But really, what are the related, related issues? What are the matters arising, if you will? So keep that distinction in mind. Historically, as far as African-American music, as far as the music of Black people are concerned, remember, we share that in common, that our, by and large, our four parents were uprooted from the African continent and brought to the Americas, brought to the West Indies, right, to the Western Hemisphere. The spirituals, historically, spoke to people seeking personal freedom. In the 20th century, a, diff a new form, a new style emerged, and that was conceived as a way for people, not, not now seeking personal freedom, but seeking economic freedom. That's what the music was driving at. That's what the music was expressing. Now, it is important for us to understand where we are coming from with this thing. That's why I'm going there. So the spirituals, said, said, says Boyer, the historian on music in the, in, in the context of Black American, African Americans, spirituals, Negro spirituals spoke to the community. Gospel speaks to one person. No, I, I am, I am, I am particularly intrigued by that distinction, and I, and I absolutely concur that looking at contemporary Christian music, what is considered as contemporary Christian music, what we hold as perfection, what we tend to perceive as literally God breathed at the exclusion of any other expression of music is what was exactly conceived in the 20th century to speak to the individual, the, the, the uh, contemporary Christian music. If I'm to be a little bit more specific, what we are now fawning over, tripping over ourselves on, over, called praise and worship music. Because again, typically, that is what is pitted against the expressions of music in the Caribbean that we label in a generally derogatory manner as secular rhythms. We pit the praise and worship music, which is predominantly from North America, and in more recent times, the Global South, driven largely by one particular congregation, 
from the global south, that is what we consider as if it is coming from an archangel in heaven, as if God some somewhere somehow issued an edict declaring that this is holy music and anything else is to be rejected. But look at look at its genesis. Look at where it's coming from. And to this very day, if if you look carefully at the majority of th those songs, they have a very individualistic focus. The lyrics, even to the extent that I am afraid that it is at the risk, it has gotten to a point where we are at the risk of the music itself being even more focused on the individual and not so much God-directed and God-focused. So whereas the spiritual spoke to the community, the collective of those that were enslaved, in their sigh and their hope and their struggle for freedom, the, the form that emerged in the 20th century that was referred to as gospel was speaking more to the individual. And, in, and a very important name in all of this historical perspective then is Reverend Thomas Dorsey from 1899 to 1993. Dorsey is credited as creating gospel music. Now listen carefully, which is African-American religious music that combined the secular blues genre. Hear that word coming again, secular. The secular blues genre to sacred Christian text. The combination of the blues genre, which was considered to be secular, combina combining that to sacred Christian texts. So Dorsey became the principal proponent of gospel music when he wrote the hymn, Take My Hand, Precious Lord, in 1932. And that was a tremendous success. Okay. Even today, here is the other struggle that is going on. Now, because that was what was known as gospel music for so many years, there is now even a tug of war between that as gospel music and even the CCM. Remember, the CCM came in 1970, contemporary Christian music. So even the, even the very praise and worship, those who came out of the era of Darcy, take my hand, the precious Lord, right? The historian Boyer that we've been quoting said, that song changed the world of music, 1932, but it changed the world of music. Darcy died in 1993, but he is considered to be the father of gospel. Other great ones that he wrote, there, there shall be peace in the valley. And I'm sure you can, you can identify this one. The sweet by and by. That one at funerals, that one in the church. And that's, that's, the, that's really considered to be where gospel began. But notice that what Darcy did was to take the sacred Christian texts, lyrics, and combine it with the blues, which was considered to be secular, or to put it another way, to, was considered to be worldly. And when Dorsey did that, it was not without resistance. There was resistance. So, you know, it is said that the, the more things change, the more they remain the same, or the, and there is nothing new under the sun. So this very discussion that we're having here this evening, was contemplated back in 1932 because there was resistance. The blues as a genre of music 
the jazz and blues are just the blues was considered to be secular. So, so let's, well, what exactly is it? Let me, let me use something related to, to make the point a little better. So there are some persons who have gone to the extreme of saying that drums should not be allowed in our churches because there is nowhere in the Bible that they see the drum mentioned as a musical instrument. They see timbrel, they see harp, they see psaltery. I, I have no clue what a psaltery is. P.S. and that's P.S.A.L. L.T.E.R.Y. I have no clue what that is. I've never seen a harp in 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 person. I've seen pictures of a harp, right? Um, but they argue that the the drum is not in the Bible, so we shouldn't use drums. And I ask myself, well, where, how far logically do we take such an argument? Would one then be within reason for using that same argument to say, to ask, well, does it mean therefore that Christians should not driving cars, for example, because there's no mention of cars in the Bible. It mentions chariots, certainly, as a mode of transportation. It, it, it mentions horses and camels as a mode of transportation, but there are no cars. So should we, should we use the same line of argument? Would we be, would it be fitting to say that Christians should not use cars because cars are not mentioned in the Bible? The point I'm making is that such an argument is a, a very, very, very weak argument. And that is part of how the argumentation was. Well, this is, this is, this is, this blues is new. It's a new form of music. And the people who created it were not people of the church. Therefore, that is what makes it secular. And I ask you to contemplate with me how solid is such an argument? The steel pan was invented in Trinidad. Yeah, big up to Trinidad. My country of birth. A modern invention, a modern musical instrument. Do we then take the same argument with the steel pan? Of course, it's not mentioned in the Bible. Does that automatically make it secular, unholy, unrighteous? Therefore, we should not allow the steel pan to be in church. Now, as one who has been trained in the field of psychology as well, I will readily admit that the power of association, the principle of association is quite a powerful principle, right? Um, so I'm, I'm not going to deny the principle of association, of how we associate, we associate things. Uh, traumatic events, for example, early on in life, later on can send a person, cause a, an individual to regress. Just by hearing, for example, if a particular song was being played in a, in a room nearby or a, a premise nearby, even if it was at a decibel level that was just below the auditory threshold, but the subconscious, where the sound was being detected, detected it then, and a record was made of it. Years later, the person, the person who suffered that trauma as a childhood, hears that same song, whether at the desk, at the auditory level or beneath the auditory level, and that person regresses. They go right back in their mind. They relive the traumatic experience or even literally regress in terms of how they were, how they are reacting in the present in the same way that they were reacting then as a child. 
So association is, is particularly important. So I can understand uh, some of, of, of that kind of hesitancy. And throughout his, but, but throughout the history of the, of, of, of the Christian movement, and again, that's why history is so important. It is only if we are not paying attention or totally ignorant to all to the, the history of the Christian faith, we would not be aware of some of the various adaptations that have been made where things that had their origin in even in paganism were co-opted and brought into the Christian faith. Every year, for example, at, at Christmas, there is this reigniting of this discussion of wh whether December 25th is the, an accurate time for observing the birth of Jesus because it is winter and that could not have been accurate and that it was really a, a festival that was in existence in paganism that the um, the, the early the early church co-opted and repurposed similarly with easter that there were other festivals that were celebrating spring and different different kinds of things that were co-opted to reflect the concept of new life that emerges from the resurrection of Jesus. So that is nothing new. So I ask myself, having done that and having justified it and having defended it over the years, should we then be making a, 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 a big noise now about co-opting other genres of music, particularly because it is going to be very, very difficult in my, certainly in my estimation, to conclusively indicate that a particular genre of music is intrinsically holy and righteous, as opposed to another genre of music. What parameter do we use? Do we use the parameter of culture? And if so, who gets to decide which culture dominates and which culture becomes sub subservient? Should it be the music, the genre of music, the style of music, that is the arrangement of notes and bars and, 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 and clefs and so on, that uh, has arisen from among the Jewish people? And if so, what makes their style of music superior to a style of music that originates in, in Northern Ireland or in Iceland or in Antarctica for that matter, or a style of music that originated in Trinidad, the pan music, or a style of music that originated in Jamaica from, from the ska to the rock steady to the reggae to the dance hall. So the point I'm making in, in making is, how do we determine objectively which genre of music, which style of composition, which arrangement of musical bars is intrinsically holy and which one is not? I submit to us, therefore, that the very designation, the very label of a rhythm, a rhythm, you know, rhythm, of course, but a rhythm, as secular is derogatory and discriminatory. I submit that to us. And I submit further to us that our rush to classify, especially our homegrown, our native tribal music forms, for one, that is the African based. Uh, heavy drum beats, heavy dependence on drum beats, right? Uh, and and all the, the, the dance movements that go with that, 
where there's a, a lot of bodily movement where the entire body gets put into the dance that the drumming evokes. That our rejection of that, our demonization of that, and our homegrown uh, uh, forms, the ska, the rock steady, the, the reggae, the dance hall. And you see, you see how the, 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 the thing, how it, it has morphed over time. Right? Our rejection of that, our rejection of, of calypso as a style, as a form, as a genre, our rejection of soca. In and our demonization of them, declaring them to be secular, and our rejection of them, and our convincing ourselves that worship music that is fit for use in our what we what we mysteriously call our divine worship services, a, a rather puzzling terminology. I keep asking, well, if, if that main morning service on, on Saturday or Sunday is the divine worship, what exactly are the other services? What does that mean? It's, it's, it's a peculiar concept that I don't get. But okay, our divine worship, as we call it, that the form of worship of music that is acceptable, and fitting to be played that only that God will accept as worship. How we came by that, I have no clue. Where we see that in the Bible, I have no clue. That our acceptance, what we accept, is ostensibly the CCM, the Contemporary Christian Music. That we, which, as I pointed out from the beginning, is generally, from its inception, generally self-focused, self-directed, individualistic in nature, as opposed to the spiritual. The Negro spiritual, for example, which focuses on the community and speaks to the community and speaks God's mind into the lived reality of the people. So the Jesus that we read about in the Gospels declared in his own mouth in Luke chapter 4 from verse 18 and following his manifesto. His purpose, his declared purpose, as he quotes from Isaiah 61, largely, and Isaiah 58 in part, his mission, his purpose, what he was about. The spirit of Yahweh is upon me, for he has anointed me to declare the good news to the poor. The very word from which we coined the term, the gospel, to declare the good news, to set at liberty them that are bound to give sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, those that have been imprisoned, to release them, to bind up the broken, and to declare the acceptable year of the Lord's favor. That as you read the Old Testament prophets, for example, their prophesying was predominantly telling forth the word of God, the mind of God, God's corrective to the vicissitudes of life. God's voice of thunder against the things that broke the heart of God. The injustice, the excesses of the rich, the boot of the powerful and the mighty on the throat of the oppressed. That the Negro spirituals follow much more closely that concept of prophecy. The Jesus of the Gospels is the liberator, the, the, the total, the ultimate liberator. And it is the spirituals that convey that message. 
what is what was the nature of that style? Heavy reliance on the African the African form. But what became of that? It is that which was flogged and systematically taken away from our foreparents. A systematic process of brainwashing the people of the Caribbean to cause us to want to recoil from and to reject that which is our own and to accept in a wholesale manner that which comes from the North, ultimately that which the very colonial powers represented. So they made us to be ashamed of our music. They made us to be ashamed of our language. They made us to be ashamed of our traditional forms of dress. And they forced upon us a concept that to be Christian is to look, to speak, to sing, to dance, and to dress like the Europeans. A couple of years ago, there was a huge furrow here in Jamaica about the launch of the Jamaica New Testament, the Patwa Bible. And to this very day, there are significant amounts of the population. But much to my great disappointment, including a significant portion of the church community that has not accepted the Jamaican New Testament, that have gone as far as to say that this is sacrilegious. How could you translate the word of God into Patwa, into Jamaican Creole? Give us our KJV. Well, 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 well. I, 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 I want us to remember that the word of God was not written in English language. I want us to remember that there was a time when English language, English was the language of the hooligans and the, the ruffians, and that the very project to translate the word of God from Latin, which was the language of Rome, the dominant world power at the time, by the very King James, was met with ridicule the very question we are contemplating how could you take the word of god and put it in a secular language was the argument and the people literally lost their lives for being involved in the project to translate god's holy word into the language of ruffians and hooligans Look at, look, look at where we are now, where most, let me not say most, a lot of people in the Caribbean, almost, you almost have to say, literally believe that God's language, God's official language is English. And God's official language of communicating his, his mind, his will, his word, is the King James Version of English. I kid you not, there are, there, are, there are certain expressions in the KJV that when I read them, I have to read the verse two and three times to really get a mental picture of what the verse is saying because this, this is language from 1516. But so it, it, it was the same considerations I think we have to bring to bear on this discussion. So there is one side of this where I believe we are not worshiping God in spirit and in truth until we do so in the fullness of the freedom to worship God in the fullness of who we are in accordance with our identity. We are people of the Caribbean. We are people of African descent. All right. Uh, thanks, Adrian. Adrian says, if the reason behind writing the Path of Bible is evangelical, then I have no problem with it. And that absolutely, that's what it is. It is in an effort to place the word of God 
in a form that is easier to understand because it is the heart language of the people of Jamaica. Much the same as the Wycliffe Bible translators would do when they go to the Congo, when they go to the heart of Africa, when they go to the heart of South and Central America. You find the heart language and you, you learn it and you translate the word of God into that language with no less rigor paying attention to the, the, the rules of biblical translation and the original biblical languages and all so that you adequately convey the word of God as you move across the language threshold. At the end of the day, if people cannot see clearly in their mind so that they can hear the word of God, that's what Paul says. How will they, how will they, how will they hear if no one preaches to them? How will they know if they don't understand? Faith comes by hearing. And if you are unable to hear the word of God clearly, in your language, then it means that there is a language barrier that needs to be broken up. And by the way, that was the whole point of Pentecost. We just observed Pentecost Sunday a couple of weeks ago. That was the whole point of the cloven tongues of fire that descended. They heard the people from these various regions far away from the heart of Jerusalem heard the message, they heard the people of God speaking in their language, their heart language, their native language. The purpose of that Holy Spirit coming was to empower the people of God to be able to communicate to those in the beyond Jerusalem, beyond Judea, beyond Samaria, in their language, so that there would be no barrier. So it, it, it is ultimately evangelical. The same with music. The word of God remains constant, right? Uh, I'll come to that point, Adrian, and thanks so much for your, your, your comments. The, 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 the word of God remains constant. What changes through time and through history and in different cultures is the vehicle that we use to convey the word of God. That's what the Apostle Paul did when he got to Mars Hill and he recognized all the statues. He pulled on that. And he used that as his entry point. He exegeted the culture. And recognizing the religiosity of the people there. He used that as his entry point. He went as far as to quote one of their poets. He said, as one of your poets has said. To make his message to them. All right. Uh, let me see what, what let me let me take this. Most Adrian says most of the people I hear backing the Patro Bible is really pushing something of our own, a kind of pride, not evangelical. I am therefore very aware of the push behind it. All right. Well, uh, that has not been my experience, Adrian. In, um, from 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 my and vantage point as a pastor, as one who has who has some amount of involvement in the overall project and the, you know, the persons at the Bible Society of the West Indies, for example. All right. So there may be some of that, but certainly from, from my vantage point, I've not seen that. If, if the motive is wrong, well, they, have, they will have to give an account for their own motives. Um, but from a linguistic perspective, there can be no, absolutely no gain saying the the, the power of heart language. And that's, that's the point I made. So music is an important vehicle for conveying the message. Now, um, I'm, I'm wrapping up. Our culture then, as, as, as part of our identity of who we are, if we continue to express ourselves to God in worship, in art forms, forms of music that are important. 
that which they tell us is worship. And I, and, and, and I stand to be corrected, but I see absolutely nowhere in the scripture where it says that only a song of a slow beat that resembles a pop, a pop love song is worship or is acceptable, acceptable to God. Anything that is fast paced and, um, and energetic is not worship. Um, I, I see no such thing in scripture, absolutely no such thing. And I categorically reject that as an argument for why we should not use these other genres of music. So I am absolutely departing. Right. Bless you, Apostle. Uh, Apostle says, I don't know where they get that at all. No basis in scripture. And we'll have to move away from these sound bites that we, we tend to hear and take a reasoned approach to the thing. All right. Now, one of the argument that the other angle to the use of secular music, that of what I'm calling Christians remixing or remaking songs that were sung by non-Christian artists especially the ones that have very violent lyrics or very sexually laced lyrics, explicit sexually laced lyrics, remixing those. So you take the beat, the song is produced, it's published, released, uh, has a very catchy beat, becomes very popular, becomes a hit, and then a gospel artist takes that rhythm and puts Christian lyrics on that rhythm and rides the rhythm, as we say in Jamaica. When it comes on to that, I would go back to what I said earlier about the psychology of association. And I would say that one would need to be particularly cautious with that approach. That is where I believe the argument about secular has more merit. Certainly not the argument that says, um, let us label pop and rap and, and, and metallic music. Uh, let us label those as secular. And so we should not sing gospel in those styles. Uh, I, think, I think that um, kind of argument is really um, kids, kids play eh, as far as logical soundness is concerned. And it does not line up with us being true to who we are as a Caribbean people. If it means rejecting my identity to worship God, then, I, then, then we have a serious problem because God wants us to be whole. God wants us to worship him as we are. That is part of what it means to, to worship God in spirit and in truth. It means that I will be worshiping God in falseness because that's not me. That's not who I am. So that's not where the, 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 the difficulty lies, I believe. I believe the difficulty lies more in, with the remixing. And I would say where there has been a prior well-established connection of the song that is being remixed, especially where the song has particularly unbiblical, unholy promotions in its lyrics, I would say, brothers, sisters, in the gospel music fraternity, I would say, let us challenge ourselves more. Let us push ourselves more by the help of the Lord to producing more of the kinds of rhythms that we can ask God to give us producers of rhythms that would be catchy. Give us producers of rhythms that when we lay down a solid Christian theologically based biblically sound lyric on that and it goes out there 
that if a non-Christian artist wants to engage with that rhythm afterwards with loose and immoral content, that's up to them. So let's set the agenda. Let's not be, let's not fall asleep in our thoughts and our process and get too lazy. At the same time, I've, I've heard the view expressed by persons who are not Christians who say that they actually listen very closely when there is a remix to the words, the new lyrics, and because they know the original lyric, the original production, that is what catches them. And then they listen closer to the lyric, the new lyric put out by the, the Christian person. And they are, it, it connects with them. They are able to ponder it and so on. There is that argument. I don't want to get too much into that. What I would say is that for that, aspect of whether secular should be utilized it, it is one that we should tread very carefully and be very cautious about in our approach to that there is a there is a there is certainly something to be said about the tremendous way in which the use of the art forms the expressions the other genres has been used very effectively by the Shoring Gardeners. I, I, um, I don't get to hear much out of Antigua. Um, my apologies in terms of persons in your uh, Christian gospel musical field there. Um, the Shoring Gardeners, the Papa Sands, the DJ Nicholas, the Rand Marks, the Goddy Goddies, and so on. The, the Stitches a powerful ministry that God has raised up through them. And I believe we, we would, it would be very disingenuous and very unkind of any of us to dare to say that these brothers, these sisters, uh, Minister, Minister Hall, formerly Lady Saw, these brothers, these sisters, are not genuine in their faith are not being used by God using these very art forms. So I think we have to really broaden the conversation, being consistent with our understanding of the historical development of what we now call gospel music. That at various stages of its incarnations, there was, there was rejection of the blending that even with the various instruments, the very piano, for example, that is now a fixture in most churches, had its own struggle with being accepted in the church. Now it is, it is a fixture. And some people behave almost as if um, there's a Bible verse that says, thou, thou shalt have a piano. Thou must have a piano. But there's no such Bible verse. Ultimately, we who minister, we who seek to convey the message of God have to firstly live for and before the audience of one where we live, live to please God and ultimately it is to God that we must answer I believe that we, we need to be doing far more in terms of reflecting on our collective history of, of, of struggle, that our music needs to be far more theological and prophetic in nature. And I believe we need to be far more critical of even the CCM, the contemporary Christian music. But I find that a lot of it is very, very lightweight and very fluffy and full of froth and bubble. And, and frankly, some of them are, are just theologically inconsistent. There are some major theological issues with some of these popular contemporary worship songs. And so for you out there in, in, in Antigua, wherever you are listening to Solar Eyes Radio, 
those here in Jamaica, those on the, on the Zoom, those who are involved in the music industry. I believe that we, we, or we need to do some serious soul searching. We may, need, we may even need to, to ex exorcise some demons from our minds. Some of the shackles that are, have been placed upon our minds. But above all, I believe we need to be far more prophetic in nature and, and, and stop placing the accent on some of the places where we have been placing the accent. We talk about things like, um, by all means, Paul says, I became all things to all men that I may reach one and so on. And we tend to be very selective in how we apply that, conveniently so. Right? But what, what would that look like musically? To be all things, to reach all men. By all means, win some, we say. When we talk about evangelism. But what, what would that look like musically? I think far more of the conversation needs to be about a deep searching of our souls as to what does God want for us as a people of the Caribbean? What are some of the things that we need to repent of? And how do we 